Alright you guys, it's episode 29 of Inner Demons. I'm going to get straight to it, but before I do, I need to take care of some household business. So check it out, man. I've been getting a lot of good feedback, a lot of positive feedback with respects to Inner Demons and War Stories. And some of you have been sharing some of your own personal experiences relating to prison, what happened after prison. Some of you talk about the relationships with your kids because let's face it, a lot of us that have done a lot of time went away to prison when our kids were young to come out and you know basically see that they're grown up and a lot of them hold a lot of resentment towards us so a lot of you've been talking about your personal experiences with that um it, it, and some of you have been giving me the impression that you want to come on the channel if that is the case if there's any of you that want to come on the channel and talk about your experiences i don't care what it is I'm trying to get away from being one dimensional. If you want to come on here and talk about your toe, I don't care, man. You can come on here and talk about with any anything. If it'll benefit somebody, that's all that matters. That's all I care about. You don't have to have been to prison to come onto this channel to be relevant. You can come on here and talk about anything, something relating to the workplace, um, success stories. It doesn't matter, man. The more diversity we have on this channel, the more people we can reach. So. If that's something that you want to do, we can do it in a in a the form of an open interview like this right here. If you don't want to be seen and you want to remain anonymous, we can do it like that. There's ways where you can still remain anonymous. We can even do it in the form of a phone call. It doesn't matter. I know there's a lot of you that doesn't that don't want people knowing that you're communicating with the channel, and that's cool, man. I get it. I understand. It's not a, it's not an issue. I don't take none of that stuff personal. But a lot of the stories that you guys have been talking about, I think it's it's it will benefit a lot of other people. I read these stories and I'm like, man, you know, everybody got a positive message. Everybody has something that will that will touch somebody or, or benefit somebody. And a lot of the times, you know, I want to talk about some of the stuff that you guys are confiding to me about, but I won't do that. I will not ever put any of you guys out there on youtube i won't talk about it i won't talk about the the, the whatever the conversation is about i won't even mention it because i respect your guys's confidence man so unless you guys give me the green light or unless you come on here yourself and do it i'll never i'll never do it so if you want to come on the channel you can either get it me through my email or sandman's email they're both on the home page you guys should be able to find them or you can get it me directly personally through my ig my ig is boxer paradigm 66187 so let's get straight to it man uh, episode 29 i know a lot of you've been waiting on it i want to make sure you guys get the full effect of of corcoran so you know one last thing man one last thing i promise without further ado man uh let me just say this this last week has been a rough week man Sandman has been at a wedding. He's doing his personal thing with his family, his brother, somebody's getting married. So he's been kind of down, man. So I've been letting him do his thing. That's kind of why the, the content has slowed down. Today, he's flying back. He should be back on track. And I let him know, man, that after this, the, 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 the show's got to go on, man. It can't stop for either him or me. Even when I was sick, I, I was still trying to kick stuff out, man. But you know, hey, stuff comes up, man. Like I said before, man, um, sometimes life's everyday situations outside of YouTube, sometimes those things come up and they distract us or, you know, we we, we got to tend to other things, personal things outside of YouTube, man. YouTube can't be the, 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 the only thing in our lives. And we got personal lives too, man. You know what I mean? So if we don't put out content for a couple days or something usually that means somebody's sick or something's going on like i told you guys before man it's all gas no brakes over here in the meantime while he's doing what he's doing i'm i'm still working on the q a 
I got three profiles that I'm bouncing around trying to do at the same time. Plus, I'm still trying to cut these these uh these videos, inner demons and war stories. So let's get straight to it, man. No. Episode 28. I believe I left off where I was in San Quentin. I'm doing a violation. I had been in Quentin probably about I don't know, probably about two months. It usually takes two or three months before they end up giving you a ticket and, and putting you on a bus, sending you either to the Bay or Corcoran. At that time, it was either Pelican Bay, Corcoran, or Tehachapi. I never went to Tehachapi. For whatever reason, they just never sent me out there. Anyway, so I find out through one of the tier officers that it's Corcoran. I ask him, I'm like, hey, where's that bus going, man? Because I heard, you know, I heard my name on the intercom. They told me to Transpac, and I heard another homeboy, who I'm not going to name for reasons why you'll later you'll understand. So, you know, they, they, they told us to Transpac that, that we were leaving. Neither one, I didn't know we were going. Um, nobody knew. So I asked one of the tier officers, hey, where's that bus going? He had to go downstairs and find out. By the time I was packed up and ready to go, he told me, hey, you're going to Corcoran. So I was like, damn. I, I yelled down to the homies, hey, man, uh, I'm Corcoran bound, bro. You know what I'm saying? And like I said in episode 28, man, I told you guys that I'm going to keep it real with you, man. Nobody was trying to go to Corcoran. Nobody was trying to get. It wasn't a matter of me not wanting to go fight. Me not wanting to, you know, I had, I had been there, done that. I did it in Susanville. I done it on the streets. I that, that's the life I was living. So it wasn't about that. What it was is that people were getting killed out there. They were dropping bodies left and right. Corcoran was just it was in the we we were right in the midst of it when I went. It had already started. I believe it kicked off in 89 by you know 92 93. It was already in full swing, man. So you know, I pack up and like I said, man, the homies were, were they they sent us off like, <laughs> you know what I mean? It was it was crazy how the homeboys were like, all right, B, all right, uh, such and such, hey man, you guys uh, you guys keep your heads up, man, go represent that shit, man. Everybody knew we were going to a war zone. Everybody knew that you know the chances the chances of of something happening were you know no, but we we talked about corking out there on the yard. It was a it was a hot topic. A lot of us that had indie tournament shoes where we had a special class for it. Guys that had been there were coming through and they were lacing us up like, hey, this is what to expect. This is what this is what's going to happen when you get there. This is what you need to do. And, and in a situation like this, there was a lot of hypotheticals that were being talked about. So it was it was a hot topic, man. And, and you know, I can't emphasize enough when I say that everybody wanted to go to the bay. They wanted to bypass Corcoran. Fuck all that. You know what I'm saying? Um, again, it wasn't about not going and putting in work. It wasn't about none of that, man. There was a lot of homies that, that's, they liked that shit. That's why they got involved. Anyway, so we go through R&R &R just like every other transfer. We, we get transferred out. They, they, tra they, uh, trans pack us. They, they go through our property. We get stripped out, throw on a jumpsuit, boom. We get on that bus, man, and we're, we're, we're Corcoran bound now. We're on the freeway, and I'm on, while we're on the freeway, man, I'm zoned out. My mind is, is I'm not, I'm in a cage because I'm, I'm validated. Usually, the guys that are validated, the guys that are going to the shoe program, they put you in a cage. Everybody else gets to ride in the back of the bus, and, and you know, I personally, I don't mind that shit because I don't like being squished up back there with anybody anyway. I'd rather just have my own little spot and just decompress, man. And that's what I was doing. I was trying to get my thoughts together, man. Um, it, it's a mental, it's a mental thing as well. You know, you're on your way to a war zone and you're trying to get yourself mentally ready for when you get there, man. You know, a lot of different things were going through my mind. A lot of things that we talked about, things that... I had heard so anyway we're on the freeway we finally get to Corcoran it's a whole different type of, of welcoming party than Pelican Bay Pelican Bay like I told you guys before they got this speech up there this is the end of the line Pelican Bay you know what I'm saying uh, uh, you're here because you guys are the incorrigibles and you guys can't be uh, 
you know, you guys are the, are the worst of the worst, and there's only uh, there's only three ways you're gonna get out of here: debrief, die, or or parole. You know, they they have that speech that they throw at you, and then they got some of the biggest corn fed motherfuckers that come out there on the back dock and escort you. It's all it's all scare tactic, man. Corcoran has its own way of doing things, man. Um, they they have their own scare tactic. When you when you get there, you get off the bus. Everybody lines up on the bus, and they got their little speech as well, man. Um, back in those days, um, you know, they were saying basically the same thing as, as Pelican Bay, with the exception of the die debrief um, parole policy. You guys are you guys are the worst of the worst. Some of you are going to the shoe program. Some of you are going to the main line. You know what I mean? If you guys uh, you guys want to get your property, you guys need to be respectful. Shut the fuck up. Don't talk unless you're spoken to. All that good shit, right? So we go through R and R. They 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 process our property, take our pictures, do all that shit, and then they escort us to the shoe. We go straight from. Straight from there to the shoe program. We go to 4B4 left, man. That's where everybody was at. That's where it was it was cracking. Um, so me and the homie sell up. And this homie, he's he's smaller than me. He's um he's done some time, but he's not the type of cat that's he's not a leader, and he's just not an aggressive type of cat, man. Um you know, I, I've never, I had never been in any situations with him, so I didn't know what to expect. I, I, you know, I had hoped that he was a good homie. He was active. He was on the yard. We were programming. So, you know, we sailed up, man. Um, so when they, they, I remember the first thing that I remember is when we walked up to that pod. We walked up to that pod. You walk down this, like this, uh, it's, it's not a corridor. It's like a little it's in front of all the pods. It's out front. They got some cages out there. So when we get in front of 4B4 left, we stopped right there for a minute before the door opened. And I remember just looking through the window at all the cells. And you can't see nothing but silhouettes. But I remember seeing all the cells were full. And I seen people posted up at all the doors. They obviously knew somebody knew was coming. And it seemed like Within three seconds, if everybody wasn't at their door when we first got in front of that door, they were there in three seconds. Like every door had two people in front in front of the window. Those that had cellies, they were posted up. They want to see who the fuck's coming up in the pot. I mean, it, it, they're on you, they're on their toes just like I was on my toes. They, they're bringing somebody else new to the pot, a, a potential enemy. A potential ally you know what I mean I'm sure they were hoping it was it was gonna be another ally another homie wherever they were from and you know when that door popped open we walked in the pod was quiet dead ass quiet the thing that stood out to me when we were walking into the pod was that by the time we got like halfway to the stairs nobody called out to us that's what stood out to me because that told me that we didn't have no allies there. Or there was nobody there that knew us. You know, I, I'm hoping that there's a homie there, maybe an Africano that came off our yard in San Quentin. Somebody, somebody to give us, you know, a heads up about the program. What to expect there. Who's who. What's going to happen. What's going to, you know, when's it going to start. What You know, everything, man. Um, So... Already we're at a disadvantage. You know, I'm thinking, damn, there's nobody here. So there's nobody that, that I'm going to be able to get at. And, you know, I'm not going to be able to pick somebody's brain and, and um, you know, find out what the fuck's going on. Information is a weapon, man. You know, the more you're informed about stuff, the better prepared you are. So I'm already thinking, OK, fuck. The, the next thing I can hope I'm, I'm hoping for is that there's an Africano that is active, an Africano that will reach out and basically let us know what's going on. That's my only other hope. We get to the we get to the stairs and we're up on the top tier. But we get to the stairs and 
still nobody was calling out. So I'm like, fuck, there's nobody here, man. So, okay, we don't know anybody. Somebody would have called out, hey, AP, you know, somebody would have said something. Um, what I did here is uh, I heard somebody sounded like a sounded like a wood that said, hey, uh, hey, you checking that out? You know what I mean? So right there, I knew that I knew what that meant. And that meant whoever he was talking to, whether it was a South Sider, a wood, an Emero, uh, an a, another AB, a Nazi lowrider, basically was saying, you know, are they checking out? us coming through the pod maybe we're potential enemies or or potential allies um i don't know neither one of us had uh mongolians or, so th there wasn't not nothing outward that they could see that would tell them one way or the other whether we were south siders or north daniels um i had a bald head the homie had a little fade and other than that we just looked like two two messesins you know what i mean so anyway we get up we get up to the pot, we get up into the uh the cell and we go in the cell and I go to the back and the the homie comes in after me. They shut the door, they take the cuffs off. He takes his cuffs off, I get my cuffs off. So, um, you know, that was one of the first things that I remember though, is is walking into the pod, man. Um Okay, so when we get up into the cell, man, you know, one of the things that became obvious right off the gate is i knew this homie from the six yard obviously we were out there on the yard together and we interacted to some extent but he wasn't somebody that you know that i interacted with on a regular out there he wasn't somebody that i was always kicking it with so i knew him but i didn't really know him but one of the things that became one of the other things that became immediately obvious is that I was going to have to take a lead role. He wasn't the leader. He wasn't somebody that was, you know, he wasn't the kind of kind of individual that would take that would take the lead that, you know, you can depend on to uh, um, that has some leadership. You know what I mean? He didn't have no leadership qualities. It was like he was depending on me. He was looking to me for guidance. So that's something else that that you know, that became apparent from the first day that we were together. He was asking me questions. I'm like, bro, I, I have never been here before. You know, this is my first time too. You know what I mean? But later on, as I tell you guys more conversations that I had with this individual, I, I became concerned about where his loyalties were at and you'll understand why. So the first day, the, first, the, the next day, that night, you know, we clean up the cell, we do our thing. And, um, you know, from that night up until the, the, the next day, the first day, we basically spent the entire day, um, well, mainly me. I spent most of the day on, on the door just trying to familiarize myself with the pod, trying to get a glimpse of any anybody on the tier, who was where, trying to take mental notes of of who was on the on the tier that's critical man um this is getting to know you know who my neighbor well let me back up so when we first get there when we first get there uh after they took the cuffs off that's when our neighbors to our media right got at us and they basically they called over and they were like uh um hey uh where you guys from and i was the one that stepped up and I told them, hey, we're from, uh, we came from Quentin. We're, uh, we're North Daniels. And uh, they were like, oh, okay, all right. And that was that. Now, like I said, the first day from that night until the next day, like I said, I spent all day just trying to, uh, trying to familiarize myself with, with, with our surroundings, listening to conversations, listening to people talk on the tier, even after we even after our neighbors got at us right away i knew they were southsiders they did they just asked us where we were from and they didn't offer no other information but you know 10 15 minutes after that they're shooting line down the tier and lines are going everywhere so i know that we're we're more than likely we're behind enemy lines that they're all they're all southsiders and woods man um and and that's what ended up happening all three cells to the right were southsiders 
there was some other woods on the other side and then there was i believe some cats from fresno and then there was like a j cat at the end over there but i would find this out in time i didn't find it out that night it would take um showers and the next day when they started running um uh just like visits or pill call or wherever people were getting pulled out for for you know shit here and there and that's how i was able to finally um uh, make a mental note of everybody that was on the tier so there was no other homies on the tier there was north daniels on the tier but they were they they had locked it up these guys weren't coming out to the yard there was actually four of them and these guys didn't make no attempt to reach out to us. They uh, they communicated with each other, but they made no attempts to reach out to us. There was an Africano on the on the bottom tier, and then there were some more Southsiders and some more Woods. That was it, man. Um, so, like I said, man, that first day it was all about trying to gather as much information as I could. My my awareness was peaking, man. I'm trying to take in everything. I'm trying to take in uh, names, visuals, listening to conversations, anything and everything I can. I'm I'm I feel blind up there because it's like usually when I would get somewhere, somebody would reach out and tell me, "Hey, this is this is who's on the tier." We had to figure that shit out ourselves, man. And that, like I said, it put us at a big disadvantage. The other thing that kind of put us at a, at a disadvantage was the fact that we were on the upper tier. Being that we were on the upper tier, it in in the corner, it kind of it kind of just put us at a vantage point where it was hard to see everybody. You know, in time as they ran showers and shit like that, we would get to see people, but even then, the guys that were on the bottom tier that would come up to shower, only one of them would come up to the top to the top shower. And there would be one that would go to the bottom shower. So I would only get to see one individual per cell. And it seemed like the, the same individual would always come up to the upper tier. And nobody nobody got at us. That's the other thing that became obvious off, uh, right off the jump, man, was that the interaction up there in Corcoran was completely different from the interaction up in Pelican Bay. Up in Pelican Bay, there's a lot of convicts, a lot of leaders up there. There's a lot of guys that have done a lot of time. They, they know how to do time. They, they're able to cohabit, you know, basically live together and do it without, without playing the YA games, without making that environment more stressful. You know, there, I've been in pods where there was nothing but Southsiders and Woods, and they knew I was from Northern California. I knew they were from Southern California. I knew that they were. it was on if the doors cracked, but that didn't stop us from trading books, from trading, uh, uh, you know, sharing uh, uh, literature. Uh, when somebody would get a package back in those days in the early 90s when we were still getting packages from the outside, somebody get a package, you go in the cell and you and your celly right there, you guys would divvy that shit up between everybody in the pod. You make everybody in the pod a care package. And it didn't matter, man, if they wanted it or not. You just, it was just a gesture. It was part of public relations. Good PR, man. We would make bags for everybody and then we'd yell up to the tower, hey, can I put these out real quick? And the towers up there, the most of the COs that worked in the control booths were hella cool. They would pop our doors, let us come out on the tier, and put bags in front of everybody's cell. That's how we used to do it, man. When they, During football season, they would have football pools, and everybody would get in it. And we'd be able to talk football on the tier openly. Sometimes world politics would come on. We'd, you know, we'd be able to talk about a lot of the politics, the world politics, shit that was happening in the world. So... There was a lot of interaction, man, and it, it it came freely. The interaction was 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 free. It came freely. It wasn't forced. It wasn't fake. But the interaction in courtroom was almost non-existent. And you know, when I say non-existent, it was like you would get a head nod, 
or just a, you know, just a head nod, man, and, and uh, that's it. Everybody was kind of standoffish. And in retrospect, when I when I think back on it, you know, I've asked myself, how come they're different? How come Pelican Bay and Corcoran were different when a lot of the same dudes that were in the Bay were in Corcoran and vice versa? Why was it different? And I honestly believe the only thing I can come up with is that I think a lot of it had to do with the design of the prison, the way that Corcoran set up. It's just a big open pod and it's just it's it's a different kind of environment. You know, you got smaller pods, smaller communities, man. Um, you got eight cells and it's just a smaller pod and you know everybody kind of gets to know each other and you guys mingle back there whereas Corcoran is kind of big and maybe it's the other thing is maybe it's because both of them were considered war zones but Corcoran was a direct war zone meaning like Pelican Bay it was considered a war zone because at that time there was no door policy. And for those of you that don't know what the door policy is, so when we when Pelican Bay first opened up, just like most prisons that open up, when you have a new prison, you're gonna have a lot of fucking. It's just gonna always be a lot of drama. The Northanios and Sureños used to go at it all the time. Blacks, whites, a lot of racial wars. A lot of shit kicks off in new prisons because everybody's vying to, to, to take control of that prison. So Pelican Bay was the same thing. You know, we were in the midst of a war back then in around 89. Um, I forget the exact year Pelican Bay opened up. But, you know, the, the, the door policy was basically when we first got up there, there wasn't no agreement. The only agreement we had was amongst ourselves. And that was if the doors opened up, we're to torpedo out and engage with the opposition. Me being a Northaniel meant that Southsiders, Woods, and anybody that aligned themselves with them, anybody that sympathized or associated with them was considered an op. For them, it was us and the, and the Africanos and, and anybody that associated or sympathized with us. So... The lines were drawn right there. So it was on. If the doors cracked on an accident and we came out, we, we got them up, man. Everybody knew that. Later on, a couple years later, down the line, some of the, some of the leadership got together and, you know, it was for the purpose. It was a good faith gesture. One, there was a lot of people at that time that were trying to forge an alliance or a ceasefire between the NF and the, and the Mexican Mafia. A couple times, it was they tried to put it in effect. Um, Rafa from Fresno was involved in one. Black Jess, um, it's when they when they got a hold of Pete Pete, Pete Wilson, and um, they tried to have his his advisors come in as mediators. That broke down, but there was still a lot of the older dudes that were still trying to forge that peace treaty. So those guys. A lot of them got together and, you know, basically they came up with an agreement that, look, this is what they were basically saying that, look, if we come out on the tier, if your people and my people come out, at best, we're going to get 20 seconds to come out and do our thing. That's it. We're going to come out, we're going to throw a couple shots at each other. Maybe somebody gets lucky, brings out a parasol and stabs somebody. But it's it's quick. It's going to be fast. What's the purpose? There's real. There's no real purpose. We're not establishing any yards. Nobody's trying to take the pods over. So all we're basically doing is is we're becoming targets for these gun towers, man. So it, there's it. There's no real purpose for it. So let's just. Let's agree to if the doors crack open because a lot of, a lot of them felt too like some of these gunners were doing it on purpose so that they could shoot people um, you know that they would have an opportunity to shoot people that they were purposely popping doors open so these guys came up with this agreement that look if we if the doors pop we come out we just step out stand your ground look at the look at the tower ask them what 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 do you would you open my door for if there's somebody on the tier and they're not making an aggressive uh, 
you know, if they're not trying to approach you aggressively, then you just step back in yourself. If you feel threatened and you feel like they're, you know, they're 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 mean mugging you or they're they're walking towards you, then you get off. You do what you got to do. So that was the door policy. The the door policy from that point on was it was an agreement that there's no pur real purpose in, in in coming out and getting into a, a twenty second fist fight and taking a chance of getting our heads blown off. So let's just do it like that. It was no. It, it didn't extend to nothing else. That's all it was. It was just a door policy. It wasn't like it was the beginnings of a of a peace treaty or an alliance or nothing like that. Like state leadership, this past state leadership tried to try to make it seem like you know that this was a prelude to to a peace treaty that was coming in the years to come. That's not what it was, man. So anyway, the the thing that I noticed about let me get back on to what i was saying about the interaction the difference between pelican bay and corporate the thing that i noticed about those two prisons in those same type of environments were everybody was standoffish in corcoran and like i said i think it had something to do with the design and the fact that it was on and it was di directly on in pelican bay it was on if the doors popped but in corcoran you knew it was on you knew you were going to get a chance to come out you knew you were going to fight with people on the tier with you. So the mood, the 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 vibe was different. You felt that war that war zone vibe. You just felt it in the air, man. One one of the one of the opportunities, one of the big opportunities that we got before we ever got a chance to step out to the yard was when they ran the showers. Like I I kind of already touched on it. This was an opportunity for me to see some of the guys that were coming off the bottom tier. I got to, to get a visual on them. And, um, you know, at that time, I didn't know, we didn't know how they were going to run yard. We, we figured that they were going to run yard to the right. Like, who was on your tier with you? Some of the homies were saying that that's how they were doing it. Some homies were saying that they were doing top tier, bottom tier, top tier, bottom tier, top tier, bottom tier. Some some uh you know some guys were saying that they were just doing it every three cells. You know what I would come to find out later is that, and I and I'm not trying to put the carriage before the horse, man. But let me just say this: so I would find out later once everything was on and popping, man. That basically you're gonna come out every ten days after you after you get off. They're gonna they're gonna. A CTQ you for 10 days and then you get to come right back out and do it all over again you get to come out and fight with the same you come out with the same person twice you get to fight the same people twice like if they if they pop my cell and they pop another cell they'll let us out one time and we'll get off do our thing and then they'll let us out again and then we won't go out with them again they'll go on to another cell that was their policy. Why they did that, I don't know. But that was one of their procedures. So the other thing, though, the other thing is like the other part of the, the shower program is like when they ran the, the, the bottom tier, you know, that was an opportunity for me to stand on the door and see those guys. And the, the thing about it, man, that I, I kind of tripped on was my celly was taking no interest. I was on the on the gate. I was on the door and I was taking mental notes. I was the one that was watching all these guys i mean it wasn't like he could be there right next to me either but he just wasn't taking an interest in it and it was concerning it was concerning to me i was taking mental notes about that now the other thing is when we went to go shower downstairs um or when we when they ran up upper tier showers one of us would go to the upper tier to shower and one of us would go to lower tier i always had my celly go to the upper tier because it gave me an opportunity to go downstairs and to see who was down there on the first tier. It wasn't like I was rubbernecking, trying to look in people's cells because that's lightweight disrespectful. That's just tier etiquette, you don't do that. But in a war zone like this, um, it becomes necessary, especially in a situation like this, to look in the cells and make a mental note of who's who and where's, and, and just what's what. You know, the these cells are similar to Pelican Bay, whereas they're designed so that an inmate has a hard time seeing out of the cell and it's easier to see in the cell. But in Corcoran, I don't think that works, man. Because 
it doesn't matter where you're at, how close to the cell, how far. When you look into a cell, a lot of the times, all you're going to see is a silhouette. Like in, in Pelican Bay, I'll give you an example. In Pelican Bay, the doors are the same. You got a steel slab, a, a, a steel door. It's got hundreds of little round holes that are about a, a, a quarter, I would say about a one eighth inch to a, a one quarter um, diagram circle. Um, if I'm saying that right, you got a, a like. Probably like 400 of them. I, I used to count them, and I counted them one time. It's more. It's probably more like 200 or something like that. But anyway, so you got hundreds of little holes like that um, on the door. Inside the cell, the, the, the door and the wall that has those little perforated holes is painted white. You And then outside the cell on the wall, the wall is white. So it makes it kind of hard to see you don't you don't have no contrast when you see a CO walking by all you see is a black silhouette and it's because you got a white backdrop whereas on the other side of the cell the the front of the cells are painted brown it's a brown coppery color so when you're looking in the cell it gives you some contrast that's what makes it easier for somebody to look in the cell and then you got a white backdrop inside the cell so that's what makes it real easy for you to see who's in the cell in in pelican bay but corkin like i said you you got a bigger pod and most of the time you're standing at a distance and when you look in the cell unless you're real close all you're going to see is a silhouette so when i went down to the shower the first couple of times i was looking in all the cells i was t taking mental notes and seeing who i could see White, Sureño, possibly uh, dropouts. You know, I had an idea who was who was where by when they were running showers, but I didn't know exactly what cells were what. It took me a while to figure that out. Okay, so the other thing that I'm just gonna get this out the way right now. The other thing that really stood out to me about my celly was that he seemed like he was scared. He seemed petrified by the fact that we were we were in Corcoran, um, we're in the shoe and. We're all we're guaranteed to go out and get into it out there on the yard. There, it, it, it was just a matter of time before it happened. We had to go to committee and then we were going to go out there and it was going to happen. So the days leading up to it, he started asking me some uncharacteristic questions that made me kind of trip on him. It made me second guess his loyalty. And later on, he did drop out. Um, but, you know, he started asking me questions like, hey, what do you think would happen if we just didn't go to yard? If we just kicked back? Now, we were both short. We were both parole violators. But he was like within a month or two to the house. I had like four or five months left at that time. But those kind of questions, man, were, were, were real uncharacteristic. You know, he was t asking me, do I think the homies would ever find out? And, you know, I'm, I, and I told him for one, bro, that's something I would never even consider doing. For two, we would look like straight cowards on this tier with, with the opposition if we didn't go out. And for three, yeah, most definitely, the homies would definitely find out. Because for one, these COs that work these tiers, you can best believe that they talk to other, you know, that there's other homies on other tiers that they'll talk to. And it'll get relayed back to somebody. So get that thought out of your mind. You're going to have to go out there just like I am. And it's just something you're going to have to suck up and deal with them. You know what I'm saying? As 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 more time went on, I got more impatient with this guy, man. And um, it, it just started to bother me, some of the things that he was saying. And again, the other thing that just kind of pissed me off is that he, he wasn't showing no backbone. You know, it, it was like for Corcoran, it was my first time as well. You know, I wasn't scared, but it was the unknown something that I wasn't familiar with that made me feel like I was on the edge, man. You know what I mean? Uh, um, but he didn't have no backbone. It was like I couldn't lean back on him at all, man. It was like, damn, bro, take take a little bit of the lead for a minute. You know what I'm saying? Show me that, you, that you're built like that a little bit. But there wasn't nothing there. It was all about, you know, he was leaning on me for everything. What do we do with this? What do we do with that? You know, what's, what happens in this situation? Who is that? What, you know... I, I was having to tell him every. This is who's down there. This is what, you know what I mean. So, 
So anyway, that's um, you know that that was something that was starting to bother me about my celly man. Um, and I was just getting real impatient with this dude. You know, I was still I was young, and that environment stresses you out. It's it's already you're already stressed out being in that type of environment. But it's it's a lot worse when you're with somebody that you can't rely on and that you really don't have a lot of confidence in. When you're in a war zone like that and, and you know, you go out there or you know that you're in a situation where you're going to go to battle with some cats. You guys are going to hand to hand combat, whatever. Somebody's going to bring a, you know, a razor or a blade out, something. You want to at least be with somebody that you, you have some confidence in that, you know, hey, this dude right here. He's going to go out there and he's going to get him up. He's going to get off with me, man. You know what I'm saying? But I wasn't getting that from this dude, man. Um, he was just, he was wishy-washy, man. Um, by the first by the first couple days, I had probably put a roster together of almost the entire tier. Um, again, nobody, nobody was really reaching out to us, man. Um, all we were getting was just a lot of head nods. Cats were walking by and that's it. But there was a lot of communicating going on on the tier. And it didn't bother me, but I knew that a lot of that stuff was, probably a lot of it had a lot to do with us. Um, and it was just, it didn't stress me out, but it just, it just kept me on my toes, man. I don't know how else to tell you guys that, you know, this right here, um, I want to make sure that you guys get the full extent of this. So right here, it's probably going to be a good time for me to, to cut it right before we get cleared from ICC and then we get to go out. But, um, you know, and then again, in this situation, man, it, it takes a certain type of individual to be able to go out and represent the way that you're supposed to represent for your people and continue to do it. Not once, not twice, you know, there were, there was cats that went out once and twice. I've seen it. And then that was it. You know, some cats uh, went out and they, and they were like, you know, I went out and I represented, fuck that. I'm not going to keep doing it. And, and in their mind, they, they thought they were doing something. They thought they were, but that's not what, that's not what it was. We were in a war, man. We were in a war and it was, it wasn't a war where, you know, you can, you can stop and say, you know what, uh, uh, enough is enough, or I'm cool, I had enough, uh, uh, I went out and did my thing, I earned my bones. It was an ongoing war, and we were required to continue to keep going out. Even though we knew that these guys were staging these fights, they were playing games, you knew it, man. You knew that going out to that yard, you were going to get into a fight, you might get sliced up, you might get stabbed. You might get jumped, you might get packed out because, you know, when when you didn't have a celly and you had to go out by yourself, you, you were at a disadvantage. You were going to be by yourself. But, you know, as long as you kept going out doing your thing, man, not only did you feel like, you know, you felt that respect and that pride in yourself. Every time you, you went out there, you, you did your thing, you got off, you got shot at and, you know, you handled your business. If you were a real believer, you came back to your cell and, you know, and I'm not trying to glorify it, man, but it just gave you a, it gave you a lot of inspiration where you were like, yeah, man, you know, I'm representing over here. You know what I mean? I'm putting it down. I'm going to continue to keep putting it down. And that's the feeling that I was getting at that time. You know, uh, uh, and never once did I ever think about stopping, cutting off my light, not going out, trying to make my parole date. Never once did I... I I knew that I was being played into this war. Everybody knew that. But, you know, I was going to continue to go out. I was going to continue to go out. And the opposition even respected that. There was, it was a, a respect that we gave each other as, as ops, man. You know what I mean? That they were, they were worthy ops. Whether they could sling them or not, they still, they were going out. You know what I'm saying? Just like we continue to go out. Um... Every day in that shoe, man, people were getting, there, there was blood being spilled somewhere. You knew it. That place was crazy, man. Corcoran was off the fucking hook, man. 
So I said this before, but I'm going to say it again. A lot of these COs, they didn't really care for North Daniels. That's the feeling that I got from being there. And, you know, a lot of them were from Northern California. Some of them were from L.A. You know, Corcoran is like right there, Central. Corcoran, Fresno, that's that area right there that's considered kind of like the, the, the Central Valley, man. Um, but you had a lot of a lot of COs that were from that area that just – it. it Felt like they didn't really care for North Daniels, but I'll tell you like this: when you were when you would go out and you would handle your business, there would be the ones that take you out and they would see what you were doing out there. They respected you, man. They respected it. They uh, this would make them slowly come around. Gradually, they start talking to you. Gradually, they start betting on you. And we're gonna get into all that later, man. But I'll just say this: you know, Corcoran. Probably besides Susanville, because a lot of shit did happen in Susanville. Sus but Susanville was like a, I don't know, man. It it wasn't nothing compared to Corcoran, but there was a lot of shit that happened in, in Susanville. But aside from that, Corcoran was by far one of the most violent prisons that I went to. People were getting killed over there all the time. You, we were hearing about it. Um, and like I said, it broke a lot of people. It would it would definitely test your metal. It would test your 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 loyalty. It separated those that weren't really true believers, man. And it wasn't just North Daniels. It was everybody, man. I seen a little bit of everybody break out there. But this is probably a good place right here to stop this part of it. I want to make sure, like I said, you guys get the full extent of this. Um, I don't want to miss nothing. I want to cover this uh, uh, section by section and make sure that I get everything and I don't uh, skip through something. Anyway, there's another part of this that hopefully I'm going to be able to bring to the channel. Another element of this since I'm talking about the Corcoran Shoe Wars. So hopefully I'll be able to, to pull it off. You guys will see what I'm talking about um, hopefully within the next week, man. Again, give us a couple days. To get back on track and we should be back on track man i just wanted to put this one out real quick just to give you something to kind of like uh um again get you right up to the point where shit's gonna start cracking out there in corker man with that said man this episode 29 this inner demons i'm gonna try to drop you a war story tomorrow i appreciate all you guys for supporting the channel everybody that's been dropping positive uh comments positive feedback you guys remember what i said about coming on the channel too it'd be an honor to have anybody come on the channel that wants to talk about whatever you want to talk about so with that said again this episode 29 inner demons i'm out